Mark is very much part of the Macmillan furniture. He was uh, long before I was. Um, he's been in ELT for the last 21 years. Where did you start, Mark? When or where? Where? Uh, in Mexico, actually. Uh, in I Mexico. never went back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Just love it there. Good stuff. So Mark uh, has been a teacher, teacher trainer, uh, director of studies, materials writer, and is now an academic consultant for Macmillan Education in Mexico. Um, he's got an in a keen interest in teaching with minimal resources and blended learning. He's got a deep TESOL, uh, a CELTA, and a degree. Um, and you'll see by this talk, I saw, uh, I saw his Q&A earlier, is absolutely just jaw-dropping the amount of stuff that Mark knows here. So challenge him. You're going to hate me saying that, Mark, but do challenge him. <laughs> Because he's got a lot, he's got lots, uh, lots of information about all of this. So um, anything you'd like to know about teaching online, Mark is your guy. Um, that's enough for me. Have a great session, everybody. Uh, see you later, Mark. No pressure then. Thanks. Thanks very much, Will. That's, that's lovely. Hey, everybody, um, it's really amazing to see so many people online. Thanks very much uh, for joining me for the session today. Let me um, tell you a little bit about the dynamic of this session. Um, it's a bit like conversation class, right? Everybody thinks a conversation conversation class would be really easy to do, and maybe they think a and a would be really easy to do. But uh, thinking about the logistics is an interesting one. So this is what, how I'd like to do it. And if you're in the session earlier today, I don't know why you would have come back, but if you're in the session earlier today, I'm gonna to change it up a little bit. Um, because this morning I really struggled to keep my eye on the chat. It was really difficult for me. So let me show you what we're gonna do. I'm gonna just sh share my screen quickly. And okay, so obviously this is a Q&A and it's for you to ask your questions, which I will try to answer. Um, but I'm sure between us as well, we can provide some really amazing answers to some of the questions. So I'll be encouraging you guys to, to help me answer some of the questions in the chat as well. Now, in order to get your minds in the right place, to, to open up some ideas in your minds about questions that we could ask, I've created a, an interactivity here on, um, uh, that we're looking at now on WordWall, and uh, the name escaped me for a second there. I, I've created this activity on WordWall just in case you don't have enough questions to, to ask me over the next 60 minutes or so. Um, so very much the focus is gonna be on your questions, but I've just got some topics here that might kind of get your minds working. So we've got very young learners, teacher skills, motivation, tech tools, flip learning, autonomy, CLT and networking. And you know, uh, WordWall being a really lovely tool, I can uh, shuffle these around. I can select a question at random. And behind each of my boxes here, we've got a question, right? So if I were to select this one and actually press the right button and flip it, we, there's a question on there, okay? So if you guys run out of questions, um, I have some questions for you. If not, we'll be, we'll be focusing on your questions for most of the session, okay? So that's the plan. And the way that I would like to do it this time is like this. So rather than doing the questions in the chat, let's use the chat to respond to each other and, and talk to each other and make comments and have like these kind of mini conversations that are going on, that's awesome. But what I would actually like to do is for your specific digital teaching skills questions, I would like you to do this. Um, I have created, I have created for you this, which is, as I'm sure you're aware, is a Mentimeter page. And what I'd like you to do either on your phones or in your browser, and I'll put the link in the chat for you, is that I would like you to post your specific digital teaching skills questions onto the Mentimeter so that we can all see them and so that maybe we can deal with two or three related questions at the same time. Does, does that make sense, right? So if you want to go to Mentimeter, menti.com, put in the, the code and type in your question. And I'm going to uh, 
put the link in the chat as well. Double check that I'm sharing it with, with everybody. Give me one second. Oh, somebody looks like they've already done it for me. Okay, brilliant. Okay, but there's the link in the chat. For some reason, it wouldn't let me do it. Maybe I can't paste into the chat like that. Oh, there you go. Okay. So if you want to go to the Menti page and type in your questions, I see some questions are coming up. I'll give you a few seconds to type. Yeah, don't rush. Think about it. Um, and hello, hello. I will just say hello to people in the box. Seems like we've got lots of people from Mexico as well as other parts of the world. I see that Will has already put a number of questions in here for me. So... I'll look at those questions in the chat box that Will's posted for me. And if you want to post them to the board so we can all see those as well. And I'll give you another couple of minutes on there to post your questions into the Mentimeter. That way, I think it's going to be easier for me to kind of keep track of the questions. Because you know what happened this morning? We had an hour of lots and lots of questions. And then after the session, people sent me messages saying, hey, you didn't answer my question. Can you answer my question now? So hopefully we can avoid that now. Uh, and I see that the board is filling up and this is interesting right so oh it's going this maybe this one's going too fast for me now okay so there's a couple of questions straight away about assessment and evaluation online okay so let's tackle that question first of all and it's a question that came up this morning uh, and it's lots of, lots of questions about the best way to assess our learners in online classes. And um, it's not an easy one to answer. So from my work with teachers over the last 12 months, dealing with this transition to online classes, I see um, that teachers are asking me, hey, are your Macmillan exams available online? Or can you give me a good platform for creating online tests? Uh, and, and questions like that. And when it comes to assessment, I think that we need to think differently about how we're gonna assess our students for all kinds of reasons, right? So on the one hand, I think it's possible that we can convert maybe grammar, vocabulary, language focused tests to a kind of online format where they could do them in with some kind of quiz software, like possibly like Google Forms or something like that. And as Stephen Malcolm was saying in their fantastic session this morning, for exam preparation, students still need to be able to provide written answers. So there's probably going to be an argument for um, having students uh, maybe in a live virtual class on Zoom or on Google Meet, asking them specifically for testing purposes to have their uh, to have their cameras on so we can monitor them while they're providing written responses to questions. So maybe we can uh, share or post exam questions to the classroom or the MS that you're using and the students can actually respond to them live. If there's a listening stage, we could play the audios through the virtual classroom so they could respond to the, the listening task as well. So there would be an argument for doing that. But I think we also need to adapt the way that we are assessing students to kind of conform with the situation that we're in. Now in assessment, in the, in the field of assessment, you are probably aware uh, of a concept called triangulation, right? And triangulation literally, as the name suggests, means using two or three or maybe even more assessment instruments, instruments to, to check students' progress, to check students' knowledge. And so, for example, that would mean that in addition, you probably do it already when we're teaching face-to-face. -face. You, you have your written exam, maybe you have an oral exam, and then maybe some class work is included in, in how you assess. We can apply the same principle online. Right, So maybe there is an online test or there's a written test that we do in Zoom. But in addition to that, any work that we have the students do outside of the class, uh, this morning Malcolm and Steve were talking about asynchronous work, perhaps we can incorporate that into some sort of e-portfolio. Right? So written projects, recordings, uh, class assignments like writing paragraphs or emails, they could be submitted via Dropbox or Google Drive as part of a uh, an e-portfolio and they can be included in the assessment. Now, maybe you're thinking, as Steve mentioned this morning, the issue of Google Translate. 
uh, and you're thinking, well, if they submit written work, the parents can help or, or they can use Google Translate. So then maybe we just add another depth to this process of triangulation. And in addition to having the students submit a piece of written work, maybe as part of the oral exam, they talk about the piece of written work that they have submitted, right? And so they need to use language to then tell us about uh, the piece of written work that they did. As, as uh, Steve kind of implied this morning, Google Translate is not going away. And Malcolm was talking about using digital tools to, um, to, to check grammar and, 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 and spelling and so on. I mean, we all do that. That's a great thing. I do that you know, in my second language, which, was, which is Spanish. So that's great. We should probably encourage that. There's time for writing with a pen in a virtual class for a test. And then students can talk about the written work that they've done for their portfolio as part of the oral exam. So I don't think there's a quick and easy solution to how do I put my tests online? We can use the kind of the software that we're familiar with for creating forms and questionnaires, but we need to add an element of triangulation to our assessment procedures. Okay. So that's the first question. And now in the desire uh, to make this process easier for me to manage, I seem to have bitten off more than I can chew with questions here. So let's see. Um, okay, now we've done assessments. So I'm gonna move on. There's a question here which says, how to make a game allowing students to join two boxes or move boxes like story, put pictures in order. Now it's almost as if whoever asked that question read my mind, right? Because one of the questions that I was thinking that would come up in this session would be related to the use of specific digital tools. And I think 12 months ago, we were all kind of stressed out about how we were gonna move our classes online and which digital tools we should be familiar with to do that. Obviously, we needed to be able to use Zoom or Meet or whatever, and now we're using things like Teams and Google Classroom. But then teachers wanted to know which apps are gonna engage my students. And that's a very difficult question to answer, right? Because it depends what you're trying to do. And my own view on that, and the way that I've done it as a teacher, and I've, I've worked in online courses, I was involved in the creation of an online course back in 2004, uh, 13, 14, and then we launched that course as well um, and, and taught on that course, uh, is actually to start small and just to kind of um, master a few basic tools, but ones that you think uh, are appropriate um, to create the conditions for communicative language teaching. Now, I'm going to share with you one such tool and some ideas for using that tool. Okay, so. Um, what a fantastic question. I'm so lucky that you've asked me that question because I was kind of prepared for that one. So let's have a look. I'm gonna share with you a tool that I think is really useful for fostering communicative language teaching. Now this is Jamboard and it's free with Google accounts. Now, before we start looking at specific examples, let's incorporate a little bit of theory here. Um, on the screen right now, uh, you can see uh, a theoretical framework that is called the teaching, uh, the digital teaching skills pyramid. And it comes from a researcher called Regina Hampel, who I presume is German. So I'm not sure about that. Um, and basically, uh, this is a framework for understanding how teachers can develop in terms of their use of technology. And according to this model, Hempel and her colleagues um, recognize that nowadays, basically everybody has some digital skills, right? And so at the bottom of the pyramid is what they refer to as basic ICT competence, which is basic tech, tech skills, right? So you can use a computer and if you're teaching online and you can use Zoom or Google Meet, you can obviously do that. Everybody has those skills. Now, if we move up the pyramid slightly, level one of, of the, the pyramid is that teachers have awareness of the affordances of different media uh, for language teaching purposes in our case. So that means that we understand uh, the strengths and limitations of some basic tech tools, and we basically understand how they work. So for example, if you know, as I'm sure you do, that you can use YouTube for listening, or you can use Kahoot to create quizzes, 
but you know that they're not perfect and you have to be careful and there's certain things that you're going to avoid, um, then maybe you are here on the pyramid. Level two on the pyramid is about being able to facilitate what Hempel refers to as communicative competence uh, and social aspects of learning in online environments through the use of technology. So by level two, teachers are able to exploit technology uh, to develop communicative competence and to use it effectively for pedagogical purposes. Now, for example, Steve and Malcolm were talking about the use of, of Flipgrid. So if you wanted to develop students' productive skills in preparation for a language test, and you were able to do that by having them uh, do their work on a tool like Flipgrid, right, and they genuinely improve their language skills while doing so, then you are probably at level two. And finally, at level three, Kempel and her colleagues refer to the concept of creativity, choice, and own style. And the idea here is that teachers are able to use technology uh, in creative ways to facilitate language learning, but also to develop the creativity of their students. And when I think of this level, uh, I think of the work of Nick Peachy, who you may be familiar with. He's a teacher trainer, teacher, entrepreneur, author, associated with the British Council. Uh, he writes books on developing digital literacy. And some of his, well, many of his activities involve um, combining skills with, with uh, tools like PictoChart or Canva and developing English skills at the same time. So students learn how to create infographics, but also improve their English. And that to me sounds like creativity and choice. So the reason why I've told you that in relation to the specific question that was asked was um, in terms of the tools that we use to achieve a specific purpose, like the question was, how can, how, what tools can I use to do a, uh, a story activity? Um, I think we need to think which tools can help me facilitate communicative competence. That's where we need to be, minimum, right? Level two on the pyramid. How can I recreate those conditions for language learning in my life class using technology? So in, if we take a look at an example here on my Jamboard, so this is Jamboard, right? Um, the idea of Jamboard is it's kind of an interactive kind of pin board or whiteboard. And you can write or you can insert images and then different people can collaborate on the Jamboard uh, in real time. So conceivably, I could share this cut up story with uh, a pair or a small group of students and they could get together in a breakout room or they could connect asynchronously outside of the class and they can work on the same Jamboard discussing the story and moving the pieces around in order to put the story into the correct order. So, I mean, I think that answers a very specific question. What you would need to do in that case, uh, and now because we're using um, because we're using Mentimeter for this task, I don't see all of the names, but the teacher that asked that question, basically all you would need to do here is open the handout that you would normally use in class to cut up your images for your story that you want the students to put in order. And using the capturing tool or the snagging tool that comes with uh, Windows, for example, is just take small screenshots, save them as images, and then insert them onto here. Right? Once you've created your basic um, Jamboard, you then share it with your students and they can collaborate in real time on the same Jamboard, right? And so they can work together and they can put a story like this in correct order and then they can give you feedback on their story or they can record the story or they can listen to the story and check the correct order. This is actually one that I took from Macmillan's One Stop English website and it's a story of a little girl who feels that she's doing really badly in art at school. Uh, she reads some books and realizes that she's in fact very, very creative. Um, it's just that her pictures don't look like other people's pictures. The, the, the idea is the children put the story in order, they listen to the recording, they check the order, as I'm sure you're, you're aware. But uh, Jamboard is one way that we can do that simply by inserting the images onto the Jamboard. Now, similar kinds of activities for fostering communica uh, communication in the language classroom. Um, we've all done activities like this in class where you classify some information you need to discuss uh, and, and classify some information. So what makes a good job? Put the students together in a Jamboard. These uh, boxes here are all created using this post-it tool here, right? 
Okay, so if, I don't know, if we just add another one on, on here, nice office, for example, stick that into my, my Jamboard. And again, the students can discuss what the most important priorities are for them in terms of uh, a job. They can get together synchronously or asynchronously working on the Jamboard and engaging in communication. They could record themselves or they could report back. So again, I think you know, this is another example of how we can use Jamboard to facilitate uh, communicative competence. This is a, another example. Again, this is a life skills lesson from Macmillan's uh, Gateway series, for example. Um, and the final life task requires students to work together to create a first aid quiz to test their students' knowledge of the reading that they did here. So again, we could, we could do most of this in a live class, perhaps. Then we could ask pairs or groups of students to connect uh, asynchronously, share this Jamboard with them and have them write their quizzes here in real time on the Jamboard and then share it with the teacher afterwards. And I mean, there are multiple ways to, uh, to do that. I don't want to spend the whole session talking about Jamboard, so I don't work for Google. Um, but I mean, there's another one here. We've got to find the, the homophones here, right? So we've got Bear, <laughs> we've got Bear and Bear, right? For example, students can work together on that one. And uh, you know, this one on collocations would work in the same way. And this is just typing in the information or inserting the images onto the board, right? So we say, make the bed or do some work, do some damage and so on and so forth, right? So in response to that specific question about ordering stories, uh, to cut a long story short, Jamboard, inserting the images from the original worksheet onto the Jamboard, okay? So let's go back to our questions on Mentimeter. All right. Ha. Huh. What's better, Kahoot or Quizzes or Nearpod? Only you can decide that one. Um, yeah, I mean, that would really depend on, on your purposes. Okay, how to teach English to uh, English language to a blind child kind of goes beyond the scope of this session. Uh, I know the British Council have produced documents on inclusion in language learning, and I would encourage you to check out the British Council's work on promoting inclusion in the language classroom. Um, I'm going to stick to the digital one, guys, if you don't mind. Uh, I'd love to answer all of you, or try to answer all of your questions. Um, please, more about flipped online classes. Well, funny that you should mention that because um, I was thinking that would be a useful one to consider. And if we were to go to my fantastic word wall presentation, you would see that we have a, a question here, right? On the word wall, we have a question here on flip learning. So my question, which kind of relates to your question, is this one. Experts keep telling us to flip our classrooms. It's quite hard. It involves extra planning. And I wonder, is it really worth it? So the original question was, can you tell us more about the flipped classroom? So some of you probably know, and if you want to help me out with this in the chat box, feel free. Um, but the flipped classroom is a, a kind of trend in general education, uh, dates back maybe 10 years or so and it's the idea of making some of the instructional content available to be done outside of class so that in class we can spend most of the time working on problem solving or concepts or engaging in collaborative tasks and giving students feedback right and that, i mean that's a very kind of general education definition. But in terms of practical examples, well, you were in the session with um, Steve and Malcolm this morning and in the series Optimize, there's a dedicated flipped learning uh, lesson in every unit of the book. So keeping in mind uh, that Optimize is a course that prepares learners for proficiency exams. Uh, in the speaking lessons of Optimize, and there's a one page speaking lesson in every unit, it's, there's a speaking lesson dedicated to developing speaking skills for specific exam tasks, as you would imagine, right, from, a, from an exam preparation course. So in, maybe the students uh, have to talk about, I don't know, an embarrassing experience, or they have to talk about uh, the services in their neighborhood or something like that. Now, 
as is typically the case on exam preparation courses, these lesson sequences begin with a, a model recording or video of uh, some speakers uh, complete, successfully completing a similar kind of task. And the idea is that the students watch the video or listen to the recording, understand the recording, analyze the language in the recording, and then reproduce the, a kind of a version of the recording. So the recording serves as a model. And in the flip classroom sections uh, of Optimize, those first two steps of watching and, and answering the comprehension questions of about the video are designed to be done flipped. And that means outside of class so that we don't lose 20 minutes in class trying to get technology to work and then watching the video when students can do that at home and then come to class we can focus on any issues or questions that they have relating to the video. Uh, and then we can uh, set up the productive activity so they can reproduce the model, right? So that's the, the idea of the, the flipped classroom in a language teaching kind of way. And in the series Gateway, um, in, you know, in the second and third editions, the Gateway to the World is now the third edition, we have flipped classroom videos in the grammar section. So it's the same principle. So there's a video presentation of you know, the present perfect or whatever it is so that we don't lose 25 minutes of class time talking about the present perfect when maybe not everybody in the room needs to see that presentation again. Instead, the students watch it at home, do some basic exercises follow, uh, following the video. And then in class, we check students' responses in the exercises, and then we allow them opportunities to use the language more communicatively uh, in the live class. So that's basically how the flipped classroom would work. But there's quite a lot more to it than that, right? I mean, that was a very simple overview. In terms of benefits for learners, um, it means there's more opportunities for communication and output in the live class because that receptive study work gets done at home. Students can watch the videos as many times as they like. So if they didn't catch it the first time, they can watch it again. They can work when they are most alert, right? So if, if you know, they, they want to do their homework on Saturday or Sunday or in the morning or in the evening, that works. Um, and so they develop independent learning skills. And from a teacher's perspective, the benefits would be things like uh, we can deal with like individual issues that students have, right? Because, you know, your students in one classroom are all at different developmental stages of any given piece of language at any one time. So you can deal with specific issues rather than talking to the whole group with, with one grammar topic. So there's less kind of unnecessary teacher talk and maybe you'll get more work done. But the research seems to suggest that the any benefits that come from a flipped classroom model lie in the fact that there's more opportunities in the face-to-face -face or live classes for active learning. And so if we're going to set work to be done flipped, whether it's watching videos or reading a text or doing exercises, we need to make sure that when the students do come to the live class, they have to retrieve that information that they worked with outside of class, and then they need to put it to use actively in some way. So obviously in Optimize, there's a whole sequence. And, and actually, if you were to analyze uh, Steve and Malcolm's sequences in Optimize, you'll see that actually the flip section is receptive skills and comprehension. Then they analyze the language uh, in the first stage in the classwork. So this, the learners are retrieving the information from the recording, and then they have to recreate the model. So that's kind of an active learning activity straight away. And that's basically the model that we need to follow with the flip classroom. So yeah, that was quite an extensive uh, answer my apologies if, if that wasn't your question um but yeah i think we've done that one now so let's go back to your questions guys and let's see what we've got okie dokie okay straight off the bat how to motivate motivate uh shy students to participate in virtual classes Again, guys, if you've got any magic pills or magic bullets for motivation in the language classroom, feel free to share with us in the chat box because I'm sure that we all want to hear it, right? Um, I mean, motivation is a multifaceted concept. There's not one quick, easy solution. There are lots of different things. Um, related to the idea of, of motivation in, in, in virtual classes. So, I mean, I guess if your students are reluctant to participate, we need to find out why that is, uh, as was alluded to in the previous talk and in yesterday's session, I think. 
Um, I mean, if the students are embarrassed about the environment in which they are taking their online classes and they don't want their classmates to, to see what it's like in their house or, or whatever, then we have to be aware of that, right? I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to um, do any kind of damage that way. Um, motivation relates to so many things, right? Um, you know, moving away from that idea of, you know, the student doesn't want to participate because they're kind of embarrassed about their, their setup at home or they're, they're in the same room with other kids taking classes or their parents are working next to them at the table or whatever it is, right? There's all kinds of issues there. But in terms of what we can actually do about it, I mean, there's a, there's a number of things, right? So um, first of all, you know, self-efficacy is related to motivation. Self-efficacy is this idea that, we're more likely to participate if we think that we can succeed. You're more likely to do something if you think you are going to be uh, good at it. I mean, maybe that's how I got into English teaching because it's like you know one of the few few things I can I can do well. Um, but basically, that's the idea of self-efficacy. So anything that we ask the students to do uh, in the language classroom, um, we need to make sure that we set it up in in such a way uh, that they can do it effectively without you know, struggling in front of their classmates. So we need to, you know, we talk about scaffolding in language teaching. Um, you know, there needs to be lots of support from the teacher to help the students to succeed in the task. Now, if I knew which specific kind of activities the teacher was talking about, it would be easier to answer that question. But if it's a speaking task, we need to make sure that they're provided with a linguistic support to be able to do it correctly. Uh, so that would be the first thing. And in terms of motivation in general, um, and we talked about this in the morning session. Um, there are some very interesting theoretical models for online learning that can help us understand issues of motivation. Now, I can't give you a magic answer on this one, but there is um, a model of uh, or a framework for understanding online learning that comes from a researcher called Randy Garrison. Uh, and if you were to Google him, not now, right, but after my session, if you were to Google Randy Garrison, you'd find that he is associated uh, with a theoretical framework called the Community of Inquiry Framework. And the Community of Inqu Inquiry Framework is a model for understanding the dynamics of online courses. And it has three elements, right? Now, I would imagine 12 months ago, when we were making this transition to online teaching, most of us were kind of concerned about our tech skills. How are we gonna use technology in our classes? And Randy Garrison's framework refers to those kinds of concerns as teacher presence, right? The, the, the basically the methodology and the techniques and the behavior of the teacher in the class are one aspect of, of the online learning experience, which is the teacher presence. But it's important that we don't forget two other really important presence, presences. Uh, if, if bread's not uncountable or countable, is presence and presences countable? I'm not sure. I have to check that with Steve and Malcolm. Um, but there are two other presences that Garrison refers to, which are the social presence and the cognitive presence. Okay. Now, in order for an online course to be successful, it's important that we incorporate and try to find evidence of social and cognitive presence. The social presence refers to students feeling comfortable in the class, feeling comfortable enough to project their personalities, express themselves freely and take risks in a supportive in environment and that they feel like they are part of a group and that there is a kind of sense of group identity, very much like we would aim for in a face-to-face -face traditional class, right? They want a trusting environment, they want to develop interpersonal relationships, and they want leadership and structure from the teacher to be able to achieve that. That's, just, that's another aspect of presence. So we have teacher presence and we have social presence. And it might be the case that we're so concerned with technology and digital tools and finishing the work in the book that maybe we neglect maybe we neglect the social presence in online classes and then the third element of the model and the final element of the model is cognitive presence and this refers to the extent to which the students are able to engage in deep and meaningful learning in online courses right and so from talking to teachers I'm not accusing anybody of anything and don't take this the wrong way, but from talking to teachers, I get the sense that a lot of online language teaching has become kind of plenary and whole group, 
right? Whereas students in research into experiences of online classes have stated that they really appreciate a balance of plenary and small group and individual work in online classes. So we need to make sure that we're doing those kind of cognitively interesting activities that we used to do face-to-face -face in online classes as well. And so that would be using breakout rooms, setting asynchronous work and using tools like Jamboard or WordWall to, to kind of facilitate communication. Right. Whereas if the students are just sitting in the whole group and doing the exercises in the book, I mean, that might be great for classroom management. And it might also be related to the conditions that you find yourself working in. But it's not great for language acquisition and language learning. Right. So students need opportunities to engage in meaningful ways with the language. They need to be able to connect the new language with their existing knowledge and they need to be able to try out new things all the stuff that we used to do before but we've got to make sure that we have it in the online class as well right so another extensive response from mark doesn't mark like to talk um okay next question um mm, pronunciation questions i'm sure some of you guys in the in the box we'll, in the chat box can give some particular sites for for pronunciation i mean macmillan's in macmillan's dictionary online has audio recordings of songs i mean it kind of depends what you want to do with pronunciation if you want to provide models of pronunciation then there are lots of online dictionaries that provide uh, opportunities for that um, macmillan has or at least used to have a sounds application a kind of phonemic chart application you may be able to find that in your app stores and if you're looking for i mean specific lesson ideas on on working with pronunciation i mean many of the things that you find in your course book can be adapted easily to online uh, context and maybe they work even better in online context because for example if we were working with um I don't know, connected speech and weak forms or tonic syllables and intonation, then conceivably, if, if, we're, if, if, if we're doing work based on a listening text in, in class, maybe the students do the listening at home, we deal with any questions that they have in class and we practice some of the, community, some of the, some of the functional language from the listening. Perhaps for, for homework, we can have the students go home and listen again and we can have them uh, using the, the tape script that we posted somewhere online or, or, or whatever, have them kind of identify the the tonic syllables have them identify the thought groups on, on on a piece of text and they can do that in their own time and then post it somewhere online so we can check it so i think there's lots of opportunities for pronunciation i don't know if that answers your question huh. is it possible to disable erasing uh uh on jamboards i don't think so because if you take your if you remove uh the ability to edit then i don't think they would be able to move the items around though i may be wrong about that but i don't think so so i mean that's something you're just gonna have to talk to your students about right and then i mean if they have an issue they get back to you you send them a new version of the jamboard right i think that's fairly easy to fix no i i, I don't think it's a bad question but i don't think it's a, a massive uh barrier or obstacle to using jamboards Okay, we talked about evaluation. How often should we incorporate technology into our teaching? Do we, we don't really have any choice at the moment, right? I mean, that's a really interesting question. How often should we incorporate technology into our teaching? And I'm gonna answer it by asking you another question, which is what, and don't, don't feel like you need to answer this right now, but I mean, think about at least, um, what needs to happen for students to learn language? That's my answer to that question. So your question is, how often should we use technology? My answer is, well, what, what needs to happen for students to learn language? Um, and actually on my fantastic, um, on my fantastic word wall, which I'm not getting to use very much, so I'm just gonna show it off a little bit. Um, but if we go back to my word wall, there is a related question on there, which is one related to CLT. So let's flip that one over and see if we can answer both questions at the same time. The question was, 
Uh, it's hard to get students interacting and communicating online. Do you have any tips? And that ties in with the, the question of how much technology should we use? So this is what I'm going to say. Um, OK, teachers tell us, teachers tell me that it's difficult teaching online, that less work gets done, that it's difficult to monitor students, that it's difficult to monitor uh, non-verbal communication, that it's difficult to keep track of what students are doing in breakout rooms and stuff like that. And you're absolutely right. Um, but once again, uh, I'm not a magician and I don't have a magic solution to that. What I would ask you to think about is, in terms of language learning, the conditions have changed, the way we teach has changed, assessment has changed, but the fundamentals of language acquisition have not changed, right? Your students still need massive exposure to input. They need opportunities for meaningful language use. They need good feedback from the teacher and they need opportunities to use what they know. And I mean by that, develop their fluency, right? So you need to, you know, not always do something new in class, but get better and and, and quicker at reading or, or process and listening that's easy but more quickly so meaning focus input meaning focus output language work and fluency these are the ingredients that's based on paul nation's four strands model of a good language course we need these elements in more or less equal quantities 25 percent of the time meaning focused input 25 percent of the time meaning focused output 25 percent of the time and no more on grammar and language and 25% of the time on using what you already know. How are we going to achieve that in uh, an online teaching environment is the challenge that we have to overcome, right? And so back to the question of how much technology we're going to use, well, as much technology as you need to get a balance of the four strands. Now, my gut feeling on that is that in a just virtual classes on Zoom or Google Meet, and especially if it's mainly whole group classes, we're gonna really struggle to get a good balance of those four strands. And we're probably gonna focus mainly on language focused work. So then we're gonna need to flip our classroom or use asynchronous uh, content in creative ways so that students get exposure to input and so that students can maybe do some deliberate study work and maybe some some fluency work and productive work outside of the class and that's where we're going to need to use technology so i've already showed you for example that you can use um, jamboard to recreate kind of communicative language tasks either synchronously or asynchronously and then you you know we had this lovely example in the earlier session uh, from malk and steve of, of um, flipgrid which i think most teachers are familiar with but basically with flipgrid you somebody asked in the chat actually during steve's uh, Malk's presentation can they record dialogues on flipgrid um, i mean if they were together in the same room they'd be able to do that um, but basically the idea is that you record short videos uh, on your phone and then post them to the flipgrid page so it makes sense to incorporate technology there for, for production practice, for example, right? So that how much technology depends on what you're trying to achieve and as much as you need to balance the four strands, right? That's, that's my answer to that question. Let's go back to your questions. And we are working on Mentimeter, there we go. All right, let's take a look. Now, I have to confess, I haven't been looking at the chat box and I'm sure that Will is sending me important questions and messages in the chat box. I will come to the chat box at the end. Don't worry if your question is in there. Um, the question of motivation we've kind of dealt with. Um, yeah, it's not technology related. Camera shy. See, this was the question that was posed to Steve and Malcolm, we've kind of tackled that one a little bit already. Um, ideally, you know, communication is nonverbal. Uh, so ideally, as Steve said, in, at certain times in the lesson, we would ask students to put their cameras on. Okay. Uh, mm -mm. Uh, okay, so how long, this is a good one then. How long and frequent do you recommend the teaching sessions for young learners, five to six year olds? Uh, this question comes up a lot in my work 
here in Mexico. I realize that a lot of you are actually joining us from, from Mexico today, but I mean, even younger learners as well, I understand in some cases are spending many hours in front of the classroom and uh, in front of uh, the computer and, and teachers are asking, you know, how can I um, make these classes more interesting, more dynamic, more fun? And I think this question of how long is long enough for an online class is the key. I mean, young kids, surely 45 minute sessions in front of the screen is sufficient. And then we ask them to go away and do something else. Now I know that might not fit with what parents want or what your school managers want, but maybe at least we need to be having this conversation that having students, small children in a Zoom room for two hours is not ideal. Um, if that's what we have to do, then I think the key is is going to be to, um, as you always would have done in face-to-face -face classes with that age group, is to have a good variety of whole group and then kind of quiet uh, activities uh, of, of, you know, doing work in the book, as well as like productive tasks and singing songs, as you, as you always would have done. I mean, we're very young learners. Uh, many of the things that we do in face-to-face -face classes transfer really well to online classes, right? So for example, in, in a book like, I don't know, like for example, Ferris Wheel, which is one of our series for preschool, the lesson plans are actually divided into uh, circle time, table time, and then closing sections. And circle time is basically when we uh, have our kind of opening routines or our hello songs or those kinds of activities. And maybe we use, you know, maybe we're using our, our flashcards or, you know, our puppets, right, uh, to uh, go through certain routines that the children are familiar with. That can still be done face to face, right? I mean, we can still do, you know, we can still do reveal activities like that and ask students to name words. We can still do odd one out activities. Those things with young learners, we need to keep doing, right? Those kind of fun, dynamic activities that are going to work face to face, we can keep doing. If you're using a book at preschool, for example, that has a pocket chart, um, I've seen teachers with their pocket charts on the wall behind them. We can still do those kinds of things. Um, so we need to make sure we keep those kind of learning routines going on, that we use songs, but there's variety as well. And I'm not going to lie to you and pretend that I'm a preschool teacher. That's not my area of expertise, but those general principles uh, might help you. Uh, in terms of resources online, I, if, if you are working with young learners, you might be uh, interested in a website called Funky Socks and Dragons. Um, Funky Socks and Dragons, I don't know if you've heard of it already. Let me open it up and I'll share it with you. Um, but it's a really fantastic uh, website for very young learners and they've tackled uh, the issue of um, your preschool classes uh, very well on the website. So let me share that with you quickly. This is not advertising. I don't know these people. Um, hopefully they don't work for another publisher or anything like that, but it's just a really useful website for very young learners. And in researching this session, I, I drew a lot of uh, ideas from there. So maybe you guys can as well. So that's Funky Socks and Dragons. And it's literally funkysocksanddragons.com. And i try and put it in the chat box for you. You might find it useful. Okay. So. There you go. Now uh, let's go back to your questions, guys. Let's go back to your questions. Uh, you know, I could talk about phonetic or phonemic transcriptions all day. That is something that I love, but it's not the scope of, of this webinar, is it? Um, but in terms of, of self-study, I think it's really useful, yeah. Should ministry report cards and exams? Oh, I, sorry, I can't really answer that one. I mean, yes, presumably yes. Okay, in class which lasts only 20 minutes for young learners, what would you recommend? Engaging socially with the children, showing, using your puppet to express affect, making them feel like part of the group, singing songs with those children, 
engaging in the routines that you would typically have in a face-to-face -face class so that they feel comfortable and secure. Okay. All right, in, uh, interactive platforms for 10-year-olds. Um, it's difficult for me to really promote educational uh, products of other companies here, but you may be aware of some Macmillan products that have some fantastic platforms. So Global Stage and uh, Give Me Five and Share It, for example, all use uh, Macmillan's Navio platform, which is uh, a gamified language learning environment where children can create their own avatars. They can customize their avatars literally with crazy socks and silly hats and change the number of eyes. Uh, and they can engage with learning language activities, videos, audios, vocabulary, grammar, and explore this immersive world of Navio. And from a teacher's perspective, you can project all of the content from your classes and you can play the audio and show the videos. Uh, you can monitor students' progress. You can award them points and prizes for good for participation in class. And as students work through Navio, they can also win badges. And, and so uh, we can, you know, kind of gamify language study and try and encourage them to win as many badges as they can, for example. So th that's a great platform for, for 10 year olds. Uh, how to develop responsible autonomous for teenage students. Um, back in August, uh, Will and Federica very kindly asked me to participate with a webinar on learner autonomy. And we did a session called Five Keys to Learner Autonomy. And if you go to the Macmillan uh, English YouTube channel, you can find a recording of it there. Um, and I think pretty much all of it is applicable to teenage learners, but the five keys off the top of my head were, because there are many more, it's not that I've forgotten the five, but I probably could have given you 50, but the five that we're talking about there were purpose, structures and strategies, um, goals, self-assessment, and study skills, I think, if my memory serves me well. Okay, so check out that recording. Okay. Is it possible to sing together with students once tried on Google Meet? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. So kind of, okay, in terms of like transmitting the audio, in Google Meet, you can transmit the audio if you use the tab, right? So if you share your screen using the tab option, you can transmit the audio. But for reasons of connectivity, um, it might be the case that it's difficult. Now, maybe a real low-tech option would simply be that you play the audio uh, out of some speakers uh, next to you and the, the children hear it through your microphone and they sing along that way. That might be a possible solution there, but I think that's kind of beyond the scope of my help. That's a connectivity issue. Um, okay, Kahoot versus quizzes versus Nearpod. Uh, Kahoot seems to be have the best kind of interactivity options, but quizzes seems to be more varied in what you can do with it. And Nearpod goes way beyond both of them, right? Because Nearpod has much more than just quizzes. So it depends what you're trying to do, right? Okay, now I'm going to go to the chat box because we've only got eight minutes left and I want to see some of the questions that we had in the chat box. So... How does a digital divide implicate course design in blended and flipped learning? I was having a conversation with a teacher about this yesterday, and she was concerned that not all of her students can access Navio. Um, and so what we need to do is um, make content available uh, more traditional kind of uh, photocopyable content available uh, for students that don't have those digital resources. Now here in Mexico, in public schools or government schools, I mean by that term, uh, in government schools, uh, we are seeing parents going and picking up resources from the school. Uh, in some cases, that's happening here in my neighborhood. Uh, in the specific case that I mentioned from yesterday, 
um, the teacher is using a Macmillan series called Give Me Five. And just like all of our series, in addition to online digital resources, there's also a teacher resource center full of printable materials. So if you've got students that can't participate with the digital resources, then maybe we can make the extra worksheets that come as part of your teacher resources available for them. Okay. Okie dokie. How can you make an interactive survey while presenting the material? Oh, I wish, Inga, that's, uh, that's a, a really useful skill to have. And I think the easiest way to deal with that one is with Google Forms. Um, I know it's really boring, Google Forms, uh, and it's kind of limited in its um, capabilities, but you can create a simple questionnaire, a simple survey uh, with multiple choice or true or false or sentence completion tasks very easily. Uh, you can easily incorporate it with Google Classroom. Um, if you're not using Google Classroom, just keep in mind that as part of the form, you need to include an option for the student's name. Otherwise, you're going to share the form with your 30 or 40 or 50 students or whatever, and they're all going to complete it, but you're not going to know who did what. So use Google Forms, um, but make sure there's a, a space for names. Um, how important is intrinsic motivation? Uh, yes, very. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to sound rude with that one. Yeah, extremely, extremely uh, important. Uh, and how can we maximize it? Well, I mean, books and books and books have been written on this stuff. Uh, I would encourage you to explore the work of Zoltan Dornier. Uh, he has a very practical book from about 2000 on uh, motivational strategies for language learners. Ultimately, it comes down to making the content relevant, purposeful, and achievable and engaging for the people in your room. I mean, you don't need to be an expert to, to answer that, but if you were to research uh, Dornier's techniques and uh, his book on motivational techniques for language learning has some very practical techniques for doing that. Um, and that's all part of this kind of uh, social presence that we mentioned earlier, which is a, an essential element of any language course. Okie dokie. Now the chat box is frozen from, oh no, I think we're back. Ah, great. Okay, you want to learn, okay. So the question about motivation and tools, I mean, it goes back to the same point as earlier. What are we trying to do? And I think Steve made the same point as well, uh, and, and Malcolm as well. It's not about, you know, which is the best tool, but it's like, what do you want to, what is going to motivate your students? So do they want to work individually on a project? What's the best tool for that? Do they want to uh, connect outside of class and do a role play and record it? What's the best tool for that? Do you want to recreate communicative circumstances in a breakout room? What's the best tool for that, right? And so we looked at ones for communicative activities earlier. Um, so yeah, it really depends what, you, what you're trying to do. Um, the one about unsuitable YouTube videos, there used to be a kind of YouTube kids, and I think Nick Peachy used to post a lot about tools that um, you could, embed YouTube videos, but take away all of the advertising and stuff like that. Um, off the top of my head, uh, my apologies uh, that I can't think of any specific ones, but I know that the technology exists. And uh, if you wanted a kind of educational YouTube, just Google those terms and I'm sure you're gonna come up with something. Uh, and also look for Nick Peachy. And, uh, okay, QR codes. Yeah, um, very useful if you want to share links easily with your students, but we have to be sure that they have QR scanners on their phones, right? That might be the issue. Some course books, not ours, I don't think, but some course books do incorporate them. So I guess people find them easy to use, but not everybody has a QR code scanner. And well, which tools would you use to create digital teaching materials? It depends what you mean by digital teaching materials. So Steve showed us how to create a digital worksheet earlier on today um, in that session. And I've showed you how to create communicative activities using um, Jamboard. Uh, if you wanted to create quizzes, you have things like Kahoot and quizzes.com. If you wanted to create memory games, you have things like word wall which is the one that i used for my uh, interaction that i was sharing with you earlier uh, 
okay and for developing social and academic skills social and academic skills are two very different things there so for developing academic skills i mean that is going to involve how long do i have okay that is going to involve introducing specific studies uh, academic skills and strategies into your class modeling them demonstrating them trying them out face to face and then having students go away and put them to use asynchronously i would say okay um all right and appropriate tools for teens in public schools and government schools i'll take by that because i don't know if you know guys just an interesting fact but in the uk public schools means quite the opposite of what it means here in mexico um but in government schools yeah i mean something like quizzes or kahoot or word wall those uh, mentimeter uh, uh flip grid uh jam boards those are all going to work i mean they anything that's browser based is going to work on the most basic technology if that if that's your concern I, I guess i kind of implied something slightly unpleasant there by that response but if you're if you're concerned that students don't have great technology access that's probably the way to go something browser based rather than something that you have to download okay now we've come into the end of the session and um yeah i don't really want to run over time out of respect to will and federica so uh, Will if, or Federica, if you'd like to come back in, uh, let me know if there's anything else you'd like me to do before the end of the session or answer any specific questions. Maybe there's somebody here who was in this morning's session and I haven't answered their question now and I didn't answer their question this morning. If that's you, I'll very happily try and answer your question. Great stuff. Mark, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mark. I'm going to give you a, a it sounds solitary, but I'm sure it's absolutely not. It was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> session thank you so much i mean you've yeah i mean you answered so many questions there you were just thrown so many different questions and i want to thank you on on behalf of the rest of Macmillan education and all the teachers here just thank you so much that was just an absolutely invigorating uh, lesson from you thank you so much mark